what we're about to do yield favorable results, may give us the capacity to benefit others, may help us overcome ignorance and limitation, may clear away all obstacles on the path, may lead us to the union of wisdom and compassion. Om Ah Om So. I bow to the Lord of compassion. Without faith in the teacher, I have no guide. Without faith in the Buddha, I have no shelter. Without faith in the Dharma, I have no path. Without faith in the Sangha, I have no support. Without faith in the promise, I have no assurance of victory. When faith is undefiled, the mind is pure. Obliterating pride, it is the root of reverence and the foremost possession in the treasury of Dharma. Bless me to have the faith that is clear wisdom. If I do not practice with constancy and fervor, my formations will bind me to the cycle of suffering. If I do not recite the name with eagerness and gratitude, I will die in anxiety and oppressed by regret. Bless me to cultivate the effort that avoids, the one that overcomes, the effort that develops, and the one that sustains. If I do not remember the instructions of my teachers, I will stumble and fall on the path of perfection. If I do not recall the mind of renunciation, I will fall in the pit of delusion and sorrow. Bless me to keep in mind the ground, the path, and the result. If I scatter my thoughts, the arrow of my bow will miss its target. If I squander my time in secondary practices, death will find me unsettled. Bless me to live with a mind of enlightenment and die with a name. If I live with the view of existence, I will collect shadows. If I die with the view of non-existence, I will stumble in darkness. Bless me to know the emptiness of the dependent and the unhindered plenitude of natural perfection. As the wheel follows the ox that pulls the cart, all my thoughts, words, and deeds have consequences. Bless me to keep my view as high as a white-tailed eagle's and my conduct as careful as a blind man's on a steep mountain trail. Uh, this particular prayer is, uh, it's a mouthful, and it's full of uh, Buddhist imagery and some Tibetan imagery as well, so we're going to have to explain that. This uh, is the fourth, life and death. Right? And these are very central instructions, and they're basically the instructions to put into practice the five strengths. Right? If you read in the bottom, we already always have what are the uh, particular instructions that these prayers address. So these are the mind training instructions 19, 20, and 21, life and death. And uh, Mind Training 19, the instruction is practice the five strengths during life, right? which are faith in the three jewels, effort in practice, mindfulness of the Dharma, concentration on enlightenment, and wisdom of emptiness. Then number 20 is practice the five strengths at death. Faith in vows, effort in recitation, mindfulness of definitive aspiration, concentration on the holy name, and wisdom of Buddha nature. And then number 21, the instruction is, conduct is always important. <laughs> right. So this is what our uh, prayer is uh, expounding on. Right? And remember, these prayers are meant for what? These prayers are meant to cause a revolution at the base. What base? The 
ground consciousness, the alaya vigiana, where all our karmic formations, our tendencies, our seeds, our dispositions um, to act in particular ways are stored. Right? So as usual, the prayer starts, all of these prayers are directed to the Lord of Compassion, that aspect of our own Buddha nature that is skillful in means, right? because this is an applied knowledge. This is not merely a, a study of the Dharma in the abstract. This is application of the Dharma. If uh, we were uh, merely studying the wisdom of the Dharma, we would uh, be bowing to Manjushri, right? the Lord of Wisdom, that aspect of our own Buddha nature or Buddha essence that reflects a great wisdom. But this is very practical, so we address our prayer to the Lord of Compassion, remembering very clearly that it's not an external being, not somebody outside, but uh, an aspect of our own true self. So we begin by some statements that are uh, pretty strong but also very true. It is said throughout that in all the teachings, actually in all the schools of Buddhism, that the Dharma begins with refuge. And we take refuge in the three jewels. Of course, in the Tibetan tradition, we take refuge in the teacher and the three jewels. Uh, and that's why we say Namo Gurave, Namo Buddha, Namo Dharma, Namo Sangai. Because without the teacher, we wouldn't know the three jewel, would we? <laughs> How would we know? Um, would we get like a breeze from you know somewhere that? No, we need, as in everything else, we need a teacher, right? So we begin with a teacher, and the prayer says, "Without faith in the teacher, I have no guide." Now, I'll briefly explain faith from the Buddhist perspective. Faith is not blind belief. Uh, faith is rational and experiential. We could also use the term trust. The term that is being translated as faith is shraddha, right? Sanskrit word um, that does not have the same connotation as the English faith because we are in the West very strongly influenced, whether we are ourselves Christian or not, we are very strongly influenced by the Christian understanding of faith. And that's why people think that faith is what is that definition that is often given? Is the belief on things unseen or something like that? Buddhism takes a very different approach to faith. Buddhism establishes that faith is a matter of experience and reason. I'll give you an example. We do this all the time, right? If you have a friend who always tells you the truth, years and years and years, and you ask that friend the question, and your friend gives you an answer, is it more reasonable to believe your friend or not? Right? It's more reasonable to believe your friend. Right? So it's based on experience. Also, it could be based on reason. If you go outside and everything is wet, you haven't seen the rain, but if somebody tells you it rained, and another person tells you, no, Martians were here spraying us with water pistols, <laughs> which is more reasonable? Right? So you see, it's a matter of experience and reason. You have to apply both. So the Buddha himself said, you know, do not accept anything just because I say it. 
test it against your reason, against your experience. If it is useful to you, accept it. If not, let it go. Some people actually have turned that into, if not, oppose it. No. It's not oppose it, it's let it go. I can't understand why, uh, if you use any of the social media or whatever, people waste so much time debating what other people say. If you don't like it, go to the next one. <laughs> it's, what is, how does it affect you? It doesn't affect you at all that somebody posted something that you don't agree with. If you don't agree with it, don't like it. <laughs> There's a reason why they don't put a don't like button, right? <laughs> don't create your own. It's useless. Right? You're only agitating yourself and unnecessarily agitating the other person. Just today I saw somebody posted a beautiful picture of a little cat and just with a, a cute, and somebody said, not so cute. Well, look. <laughs> Why? What is the need to offend the poster and the little cat? <laughs> no need. So his point is that if it's useful to you, accept it. If it's not, let it go. Just let it go. So that's the meaning of faith in Buddhism. Okay, are we clear on that? It's not like accept something that is completely unreasonable. And uh, no, that's not the meaning. But we need, I mean, if we've accepted someone as teacher, right, and we have many teachers in life, many, many teachers in life, eventually we may come to accept a root teacher, uh, Sawai Lama, we call in uh, Tibetan, uh, which means your principal teacher. We may come to that. Sometimes we come to it retroactively. At the end of our lives, we say, you know what? That one was my main teacher. Right? But if we don't have faith in our teachers, we should keep looking. Don't you think? Well, I, I go to this class, but I, I don't believe a word, she says. Well, don't go. <laughs> Why go? <laughs> It makes no sense, right? It's not reasonable to call somebody teacher and then argue with them. If you don't like it, go. I, I had a teacher. She was South Indian and uh, very strict. And uh, <laughs> she was uh, teaching something and somebody started arguing with her. And she said, excuse me, this is not the Episcopal Church. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't like what I say, get out. <laughs> she had a point. She was very old. She didn't have time to argue. <laughs> but I think that you know, I was discussing this with David previously, right? A lot of people like claim an identity, but don't don't want to accept any of the aspects of that identity. I was sharing with David, like I have some friends who say I am Catholic, but I don't go to mass. I don't take the sacraments, I don't believe in the Pope, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and I utterly dislike the church. Well, excuse me, you're not Catholic. I have news for you, you're not. I mean, that's beside the point of whether, you know, it's proper or improper, I'm not judging that, I'm saying, you're not. If you don't do any of the things that other Catholics do, you're not Catholic. Or people say it all the time. Oh, I'm Jewish, but I don't go to synagogue. I'm, I don't keep kosher. I don't do this. Well, you're not Jewish then. You may be, you know, by blood or by culture, but you're not. Right? So, again, if we claim somebody is my teacher, then we should have some faith in that person. And it's not only in, in, in religious terms. Imagine that you're going to, I don't know, a cooking school. And the teacher tells you this is the recipe. What if you don't believe her? Oh, I don't believe her. No. No, I'm not going to put ginger in that. <laughs> oh. Well, it doesn't work. You cannot teach if there's no faith. And you cannot learn if there's no faith. Does that make sense? So without faith in the teacher, I have no guide. Without faith in the Buddha, I have no shelter. If I, and there are people who call themselves Buddhists, but they don't, they think, you know, Buddha was just an ordinary man and uh, 
you know, he may have had his problems and, you know, well, then what is your shelter? Why are you following the teachings of somebody that you think was just ordinary? I'm ordinary. Right? Do I need somebody to make me more ordinary than, I'm all, than I already am? No. So without faith in the Buddha, I have no shelter. Without faith in the Dharma, I have no path. The Dharma is a practical teaching. Right? If I don't have faith in it, if I just listen to it, but I don't do anything, I don't have a path. I have a hobby. Right? I have an entertainment, and actually a frivolous one, because if you don't do anything with it, you might as well not do it. Right? Without faith in the Sangha, I have no support. The Sangha is the noble assembly. Right? When we are trying to do something as admittedly revolutionary mm -hmm. as to change our own mind and behavior, we need support. If everybody that we have around us is pushing us in the old direction, it's much more difficult. However, if we surround ourselves with like-minded people, they don't have to be pure saints, but if they have a similar aspiration, they actually encourage us. They support us. They give us strength. They give us advice. They help us out. That is support. Right? And we have to have faith in them. You can't go to someone and say, well, you know, I, really, I was going to ask you for help, but I'm sure you're not going to give it to me. So damn you. <laughs> to heck. <laughs> No, you have to have faith in your brothers and sisters in the Sangha. You have to have faith in the Dharma. Enough faith, not blind faith again, enough faith to practice and see if it works. I've had people tell me, like, oh, you know, it sounds, meditation sounds interesting, but I don't want to do that. Because I know it doesn't work. Well, how do you know it doesn't work? It well, I just know. The last one, without faith in the promise, I have no assurance of victory. Whenever you hear uh, the term uh, the promise in a Buddhist text, it refers to a particular vow. It's the 18th vow of Amideva or Amitabha, as some people call him, right? Amitayus. Some people call him that too. The Buddha of boundless light, the Buddha of boundless radiance. When he was still a bodhisattva, he made a number of vows. The 18th vow, in particular, is very powerful vow that all who remember him, and particularly his name, who evoke him, right, will be born in the Pure Land. Again, the Pure Land is not a club med for Buddhists, it is a state of mind, right? it is a state of enlightenment. So everybody who remembers the Buddha, right, who is our own true nature, will be reborn in the Pure Land. That is his vow, his 18th vow. And in some traditions, in the Japanese traditions, they call it the primal vow. In uh, the Tibetan tradition very often it's referred to as the promise. Right? So whenever you see that, uh, it refers to the 18th vow. Without faith in the promise, I have no assurance of victory. Victory is very often in Buddhism code for enlightenment. Right? In fact, the Buddha is often called the victor. Right? Victory over what? Victory over ignorance. So. Why do we say without faith in the promise, I have no assurance of victory? We live in the age of the five corruptions. I think we discussed them, if not the last time, the previous time. Right? It's very difficult in our time to attain enlightenment through our own efforts. Very difficult. Just look at what's going on in the world. I, are things accelerating, or is it just that, I don't know, I'm paying peculiar attention? 
everything that comes up is not good news. And all these things affect us. It's not just, you know, the, the terror that's going here or the horror that's going there. It's everywhere. It's around us in our life, right? It's the, the level of agitation in which we live. Coming here tonight, like, I had to, like, avoid, like, five uh, crashes. I mean, people are cutting in front of you to do illegal turns. Constantly, it's you, know, you almost have to be a saint to drive in Texas and not end up cursing someone. <laughs> Am I exaggerating? It's it borders on saintliness to restrain yourself and you know give them a blessing. Yes, you need it badly. <laughs> right. um, everything around us is just pounding at our consciousness constantly. So it's very difficult. So more than at other times, particularly since the end of the golden age of the Dharma, we are in need of a fail-safe approach to enlightenment. And that fail-safe approach to enlightenment is rebirth in the pure land, where there is no uh, backsliding, where there is no fear of uh, losing any advancement, and where we will complete the path of enlightenment without obstacles. I can't say too much more about that. We gave a whole teaching on the Pure Land uh, some time ago. I'm sure we will do it again at some point, but now we don't have the time. The Pure Land, again, is not the Buddhist Club Med. It's not the Buddhist Heaven. It's not a Buddhist Paradise. It is literally the mind of the Buddha. It is joining our mind with the mind of the Buddha. So that is the first stanza. The second stanza actually begins with three lines that are a direct quote from the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra, one of the most important Mahayana Sutras. Because a lot of people think that somehow, uh, later on, people started adding faith to Buddhism when it wasn't there. A lot of Buddhists today will argue that. that they're, the internet is full of Buddhists who think, like, you don't need any faith. You know, you have to be a full skeptic. The Buddha never spoke like that. These are the words of the Buddha, those first three lines of the second stanza. These are the words of the Buddha in the Vatamsaka Sutra. When faith is undefiled, the mind is pure. Obliterating pride, it is the root of reverence. And the foremost possession in the treasury of Dharma. Without faith, we cannot do anything. Think about it. You ask somebody for the time, right? and they tell you what time is it, well, I don't believe it. Try living a whole day without accepting anything at all that somebody tells you. Try to eat something and say, well, it's probably poisoned. Without faith, we cannot live five minutes. We cannot. We cannot build on anything without faith. If we have no faith in our own capacity, we have no faith in our own Buddha nature. Again, I'm sorry, but we might as well look for that high building and jump out. Because right? what are you going to do? You're going to fail if you have absolutely no faith in your capacity, you have no faith in the Buddha, you have no faith in the Dharma, you have no faith in your brothers and sisters in the Dharma, what are you going to do? So it is absolutely essential, and it's the first of the five strengths, or the five, eventually, when it's perfect, of the five powers. So the second stanza continues, bless me to have the faith that is clear wisdom. 
And this is, again, a restatement of what true faith is in Buddhism. It's clear wisdom. It is to Wisdom is literally as the word entails originally, right? Wisdom is a cognate of vision. It's seeing things as they are. So bless me with the faith that is seeing things as they are. Because right now what we're doing is we're superimposing our expectations, our false beliefs on reality and claiming, oh no, that's true. So we ask our own internal Lord of Compassion, that aspect of our Buddha nature, to bless us with the faith that is clear wisdom. The next stanza is about effort. And it is both, uh, you will see that, that it includes both five strengths during life, five strengths at death, each of the stanzas, right? In the first, very first stanza, the faith in the teacher, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha is during life, right? Uh, faith in the promise is at death. So now we move in the third stanza to the second of the five strands, which is effort. If I do not practice with constancy and fervor, my formations will bind me to the cycle of suffering. What formations are we talking about? The karmic formations, right? The karmic seeds, the karmic impressions will lead us to continue. If, if we don't do something, right, it's like we already have this movement. We already have this direction. We already have this inertia. And it's not going well, <laughs> right? It's going what? It's going into the cycle of suffering, continuing the cycle of suffering. So uh, we are told here, if I do not practice with constancy and fervor, if I don't do something, if I just stay the way I am right now, my tendencies are not going to improve all of a sudden. It's like I, I recently had to fix my car, and the, oh, Mike is fantastic, the mechanic. Tell me, well, it ain't going to explode on you, but it ain't going to fix itself either. <laughs> <laughs> It's not going to fix itself, right? Our problems are not going to fix themselves. We have to do something about them, right? I'm sorry, I don't do well the Texan act. I don't do him justice. He's fantastic. All right, so, if I do not practice with constancy and fervor, my formations will bind me to the cycle of suffering. Right? It will continue. If I do not recite the name with eagerness and gratitude, I will die in anxiety and oppressed by regret. Everybody that is alive will die. Our biggest source of fear is that we don't know what's going to happen. Right? We've died many times, but we don't know what's going to happen. If, however, we have accepted the promise, right? That's the first strength. We have developed firm faith in the promise. If we then do the effort that goes with that promise, which is recitation of the name, right? Recitation of the mantra, Om Amideva Ri, right? And then, and with eagerness and with gratitude. If we do not do that, we will die in anxiety and oppressed by regret. Because In anxiety because we won't know, right? If, have we done enough? Are we there yet? <laughs> uh, what type of birth are we going to take? And we will regret and not doing something as simple as reciting the holy name. Reciting the holy name... Um, is an English translation of the, the Sanskrit term Buddha Anusmriti. Right? It's recollection of the Buddha. But it is the easiest way to recollect the Buddha is through mantra. 
So if we fail to recollect the Buddha, we're going to be in anxiety at the moment of death. And we're going to be in anxiety at the moment of death because that's not the best time to start trying to remember. <laughs> Believe me, you're going to be concerned about a lot of stuff at that moment, right? Uh, choking among them. I don't want to scare you, but it's not, you know, people will say, you know, I'd like an easy death. Let me disabuse you of that. And no death is easy. If it were easy, you wouldn't die of it. <laughs> it's so difficult that it kills you. Um, yeah, some are more agitated than others. Some may be in anxiety or not, but, you know, dying is not easy. Nobody really looks forward. It's so easy that I'm looking forward to it. I've never heard anyone say that. So, if we can do now, if we can recollect the Buddha with eagerness and gratitude now, we will die without anxiety. We will die without regret. Bless me to cultivate the effort that avoids, the one that overcomes, the effort that develops, and the one that sustains. This is in need of explanation. There are four kinds of effort in Buddhism, typically, right? Two refer to negative things, and two refer to positive things. So the two that refer to negative th things are to avoid. Avoid what? Avoid what hasn't started yet. If you haven't started doing ne something negative, don't start. What is the one that overcomes? Is the one where you stop doing the negative things that you're already doing. So one is don't start, and the other one is stop. <laughs> right? And what about the positive activities? That's the other two kinds of effort. The effort that develops means the effort to start those positive actions that you don't yet do. And the second one, the effort that sustains, is the one that continues the positive things that you're already doing. It's very straightforward, isn't it? Right? Negative things. If you haven't started, don't start. Right? If you have started, stop. <laughs> positive things. If you haven't started, start. If you have started, Go on, <laughs> right? Very simple. Those are the four efforts. So we ask our inner Lord of Compassion to help us cultivate all four kinds because we need all four. All four are necessary. The next stanza refers to mindfulness, a word much abused <laughs> these days. If I do not remember the instructions of my teachers, I will stumble and fall on the path of perfection. That is what mindfulness refers to in Buddhist teaching. It's not, you know, like, you know, people say, like, when you chew, you know, pay full attention to the flavors and the saliva mixing. No, that's called chewing. <laughs> Mindfulness in Buddhism means remembering the instructions of the teachers. That's what it means. So if I don't remember those, I will stumble and fall on the path of perfection. Like I'm, I'm going to do this on my own, right? Without instruction. Well, isn't that how you got here in the first place. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so we need to be mindful of the instructions of the Dharma. If, we, if I do not recall the mind of renunciation, I will fall in the pit of delusion and sorrow. We've discussed in, in previous, on previous occasions what we call the definitive aspiration which is very much also the mind of renunciation. What does that mean? The mind of renunciation is not that you decide right now, you know, like Wendy was suggesting that we shave our heads and take on a monastic vows. Uh, it means uh, that we 
firmly and not only conceptually but experientially come to the definitive understanding that no combination of adjustments in material phenomenal life is going to make us permanently happy. That we renounce what? We renounce that illusion. That is the mind of renunciation. Your next job is not going to make you happy. Your next home is not going to make you happy. Your next pair of shoes will not make you permanently happy. The car, fill in the blanks, the boyfriend, the girlfriend, the divorce, whatever it may be, is not going to make you permanently happy. If we keep on believing, ah, if I make this little adjustment, I'll be just fine. That is what? That is the pit of delusion and sorrow. <laughs> That's what it is. So we need to recall the mind of renunciation, which is in its positive side, is called the definitive aspiration. Definitive aspiration means that you come to the experiential decision that enlightenment, full enlightenment, is the only worthwhile goal. That doesn't mean that you stop eating and sleeping, no. It means that you keep in mind uh, these are maybe necessary conventionally, but this is not where I derive my sense of self, my satisfaction, my happiness. This is just necessary to live. That's all. This is a temporary crutch. But it's not, you know, it, it's like, you know, if you break your leg, which I'm not wishing on anyone, right? So you get crutches. What are you going to do? You're going to start like, you know, encrusting them with diamonds, <laughs> right? And, you know, uh, gilding them in gold and all this thing. And says, oh, look at my crutch. Isn't it beautiful? Uh, uh, kind of foolish, isn't it? Because sooner or later, we hope, you'll give it up. It's just a crutch. It's just a crutch. It's not your permanent way of locomotion, we would hope. So, in the same way, we have to understand, yeah, we have, while we are in this phenomenal world, we need a few crutches here and there, but this is not something that we should be paying attention to, like it's the beginning and end of our happiness. It isn't. They are all causes of suffering. All the things in the material world. All of them. This is not negativity. This is objectivity. Yes? I always think of my friends who have children and grandchildren and how they're spending their last years, you know, trying to do good by them. And in their heart, they're, they're, you know, they're doing the right thing. Yes. And I also remember what Buddha said, you have sons, you have children. Yes. And, you know, I said, well, you know, you can help them go to college and all that, but isn't it more important to help them be a Plus, very often they postpone their own spiritual cultivation, right? Well, not now because I have children. And then, well, not now because I have grandchildren. And then, if I can only live to see my grandchildren get married. And of course, if you do live to see them get married, then I want to see the birth of my great grandchildren. And then, if I can only see them, right? It's, it never ends. It never ends. It's like the famous story of the, the man who's walking, the businessman who's walking and sees a Buddhist monk sitting by the side of a road in meditation. He says, you're young. What are you doing? You're wasting your life. And the Buddhist monk says, what should I do? He said, well, you know, you could uh, get up and try to go find some work. And he said, well, if I found work, what I would do? So but you'd earn some money, and then what would I do? You'd um, be able to buy, you know, land. Say, and what would I do with that? Well, then you'd, you know, harvest crops, and you would sell them. I said, well, what would I do with that? Well, then you could get married. I said, okay, and what would I do with that? Well, then, you know, you could get a cow, and you could, your wife could help you, and you could both 
earn enough money. And what we would do with that? Well, you could, you know, help your children become prosperous. I said, and what would I do with that? I said, you know, well, then when you're old, your children can help you in old age. I said, and what would I do then? Well, then you could sit at the end, and you know, the side of the road and meditate. I said, but I'm doing that now. <laughs> it's so much trouble for nothing. It is. It's a lot of trouble for nothing. But sometimes we have to go through it. So the next... <laughs> That's the second time I heard that story today, but I heard it earlier today from a patient who was about the guy who's just fishing. <laughs> Somebody says, why don't you get a job? You can do this, get a business, get a big corporation. All that. And then what do I do? Well, then you can retire and you can come back here and fish. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this stanza ends... Bless me to keep in mind the ground, the path, and the result. I don't know if you remember, but we've said this. In the mantrayana, the vairayana, the swift path, right? what is the ground? The ground is Buddha essence. The path is the unveiling of Buddha essence, and the result is the unveiled Buddha essence. Right? So, what we need to know is that it is the same Buddha essence, the same Buddha nature, appearing veiled right now, unveiling as we cultivate spiritually, and fully unveiled at the end. But it's not three different things. There are different moments, just like the sky, right? It, 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 you can go outside, it's very, very cloudy. But it does not affect the sky. Then the wind comes and it blows away some of the some of the clouds, right? And you can see a little bit more of the sky. And then finally the wind blows all the clouds away. And the only thing you see is sky. But the sky never changed, did it? Or the sun, right? Sun, we say, oh, you know, the sun didn't come out today. The sun is always out. It is always out. Our view may be covered. So it's the same thing with our Buddha essence, our Buddha nature. It is always there. Right? It is the ground, it is the path, and it is the result. Well, the next stanza tells us, If I scatter my thoughts, the arrow of my bow will miss its target. I don't know if any of you have practiced archery. Any, anybody here? Uh, well, you know that what happens if you're looking at a lot of different places, that's where your arrow is going to go. Actually, it happens in driving too. That's why they tell you, you know, if there's like somebody riding a bicycle next to you, don't look at them while you're driving, because guess where your car is going to go? Right to the bicycle. So the mind is that way. If your mind is scattered, right, you're not going to shoot straight, meaning you're not going to accomplish what you set out to do. We call it distraction, don't we? Whenever you set yourself a goal and you become distracted, do you attain your goal? Distraction is the enemy of attainment, right? So if you scatter your thoughts, you will miss the target. If I squander my time in secondary practices, death will find me unsettled. And this is a very important thing. You know, the Buddha did teach thousands of different practices for different people, but all with the same purpose, right? Some people have to enter the Dharma here, and some people will enter here, some people will enter here. It depends on where we are, right? Just like if we all were home, and we were all coming here to the DMC, Right? We take different routes, 
but we eventually all came to the same place. And you, you cannot start from where you're not. You have to start from where you are. So there are many practices that we could call their introductory practices. But some people get so attached to the introductory practices right, that they never move on. And that's what this uh, line refers to. If I squander my time in secondary practices, death will find me unsettled. There are certain practices in Buddhism, for example, that are very, very good to promote physical health. But if you spend all your time and your energy pursuing physical health, even through Buddhist practices, you're squandering your time because guess what? No matter how good care you take of your body, it's not going to make it. Or some people, you know, say like, you know, Buddhists are very good at, uh, I don't know, helping the environment. It's nice, but it's a secondary practice. It means you respect your environment. We should respect our environment. My teacher used to say, one of his central teachings was leave no trace. <laughs> Meaning, you know, people shouldn't even notice that you've been there. <laughs> if anything, you should leave it a little bit improved, but not too much. <laughs> that means you put too much of a stamp, of, your own stamp on it. You know, just improve it a little bit. Leave it cleaner, perhaps, but no different. Right? Don't make a forest into a garden. <laughs> but if you spend all your time in secondary practices, auxiliary practices, or um, actually my teacher shared this with me in Spanish, and he said, practicas triviales, trivial practices. Trivial when compared to enlightenment. Right? If the if the outcome of the practice is not enlightenment, it's kind of trivial. It may be good to begin with, but it's not going to make you... You know, there's some people, and I met a lot of them, monks and nuns, you know, like, you know, the, the skirt has to be so many inches from the uh, ankle up, and the... And, you know, like, you know, these things, believe me, they're not made for Westerners. You know, you have to wear the belt, you know, eight inches above the navel, and, oh, uh, you know, and they, they actually, there's some people who like, oh, no, yeah, the folds have to fold this way, and one that way, and it seems like, is that going to give you enlightenment? Right? Or, you know, the, the, a lot of... Um, Tibetan monks and nuns like would think that this is inappropriate. I should be. I'm teaching, so I should be. Well, n not only putting this on, but I should also wear a vest. Well, they don't live in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. They don't live in Texas. In Tibet, you can wear lots of clothes. Not here. Right? <laughs> right? Um, but what I'm saying is, you know, people give a lot of importance to very minor things. Very, very minor things. Some people say, like, oh, oh you know, like, for example, my teacher said, you can use any type of mala to do your practice, right? If it's body seeds or this or that. I wouldn't suggest aluminum, but I don't think they sell them. Right? But... Some people say, no, 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 if it's for this yidam, it has to be, you know, a transparent crystal. If it's for that yidam, it has to be jade. If this for this one, it has to be that thing. Uh, no, that's, if you have a very complicated mind and you like to elaborate a lot, yeah, you know, we can give you all sorts of little details that you can obsess with, right? <laughs> you know, the Buddha was very familiar with OCD. <laughs> so, you know, if you are OCD, he'll give you like, okay, you want, you, you want to have a lot of things to worry about, here they are. But they are secondary. They are secondary. After all, when asked to summarize his 45 years of teaching, what did he say? This is a quiz. Do no harm. Do good. 
purify the mind. That's it. Notice that nowhere in there it says, measure the length of your skirt from the ankle. <laughs> that wasn't his final instruction, right? Uh, many of these things are minor. So we have to pay attention to what is truly important. If not, death will find you unsettled. Actually, I find that some of the most agitated monks and nuns that I have met are the ones that are very detail-oriented. They're constantly finding fault with everybody else. Oh, that's not right. <laughs> the folds, the folds don't fall. <laughs> They're very agitated all the time. My teacher used to give some of those people a heart attack because uh, he uh, he found men's bicycles uh, dangerous. And if you're a man, you know what I'm referring to. They have that very inappropriate bar, bar right where it shouldn't be. Right? <laughs> so uh, he had a you know, a woman's bicycle, and uh, when he went to get it, they only had red ones, so he had a red woman's bicycle, <laughs> and he used to pedal <laughs> around Cambridge, you know, uh, skirt flying in the wind, and, <laughs> like, and some of the monks were horrified, like, <laughs> Ripoche, no, no, <laughs> we'll carry you. So then I have to depend on four of you coming here to carry me to it. Anyhow, uh, obsessing li with little details is not very profitable. Bless me to live with the mind of enlightenment and die with the name. What is the mind of enlightenment? The mind of enlightenment is the English translation of bodhicitta. Bodhicitta also is translated as great purpose. It means... And, and what is the difference between liberation and enlightenment? You remember, liberation is to be free of suffering, personally. Enlightenment is to have the capacity to free others from their suffering. So we should live right, with the mind of enlightenment, always looking to reduce or eliminate the suffering of others, but we should die with the name we should die with the recollection of the Buddha. The next stanza tells us, if I live with the view of existence, I will collect shadows, which is the view of existence. It is the view of accepting phenomena as independent, substantial, or and permanent. And as long as we believe that, we're going to give them a lot of importance. Right? Things. Basically, it's to believe that things people, situations, are worth your undivided attention. That is the view of existence. Right? It is called eternalism. This is making things that are very temporary into eternally important things, which we do all the time. We cry our eyes out over things that I am, I am sure all of us here, we're of different ages, but I am sure we're old enough to remember. At some point, we cried our eyes out over something that we don't remember what it was right now. <laughs> is, that, is that so or not? I mean, do you remember like crying like, oh, and you don't, but you don't know what about? That it was so important that you thought, oh, I can't live without him or her or it or... And now you don't even remember who it was. <laughs> there was a popular... I think she was Spanish or Cuban, but she had a big uh, hit when I was growing up. Se me olvidó que te olvidé. I forgot that I forgot you. <laughs> Which sounds much nicer in Spanish, but, uh, but, but 
basically just saying, you know, I forgot you, and then I forgot that I forgot you, and you know, here, here we are all over again in the same mess. Right? <laughs> But isn't that the truth, that things that seem so important at one moment, because we give them this importance, end up being nothing? It's going to be the end of the world. I just remember, there wasn't there an, an English song? Why does the world keep on turning? Why? Because what you're worried about is not that important. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry to break it to you, but you know, no. And you know, in case you, the Trojan War was not about Helen, <laughs> right? Can I be sure two countries will not go to war over one woman? Never happened. Right? They may use her as an excuse, but no, it doesn't happen, right? If they didn't have, you know, <laughs> the desire to go to war. No, nobody goes to war over love. No. Well, only with the person that they love. <laughs> that will happen. Love, love is war. Yes. So what do we say here? If I live with the view of existence, I will collect shadows, because that's all it is. It's shadows, right? It's not substantial. And the next line says, if I die with a view of non-existence, I will stumble in darkness. The opposite of that, the opposite view, which is also an extreme, is that nothing is real. If you die with that wrong view that nothing is real, you will stumble in darkness. You will be afraid. That's what we do in darkness, right? We, we stumble. We're afraid. Of course we would be afraid. You're going from existence, supposedly, to absolute non-existence. Remember the famous words of uh, the superior Nagarjuna, right? Emptiness cures all wrong views, but the view of emptiness is incurable. <laughs> it's a remedy. It's not supposed to be used when there's nothing to remedy. Right. It's like something that causes you to vomit up poison. You can't keep taking it because then you will die from vomiting. <coughs> so both views are a problem. The view of existence, the view of non-existence, they're considered the two extremes. Bless me to know the emptiness of the dependent and the unhindered plenitude of natural perfection. So this is the middle way. This is the great middle way. What? As we say in the prayer to Dolpopa, to view that which does not exist as not existing, and that which exists as existing. Right? So what does not truly exist? Remember, from the philosophical point of view, existence implies independence, substantiality, and permanence. Right? What in the phenomenal world is permanent, substantial, and independent? Nothing. <laughs> right? So, bless me to know the emptiness of the dependent. And the what? And the unhindered plenitude, plenitude, the fullness of natural perfection. Like the sutras say, right? Buddha nature is full of qualities beyond the number of grains of sands on the banks of the Ganges, right? A lot, <laughs> in other words. Right? It is plenitude, it is total fullness of quality. And that is real, and we need to be aware of that plenitude. It's not that because the false is false, the true is also false. Right? The false is false and the true is true. In fact, if the true were not true, the false would not be false. The false would be the only thing that is. 
I hope I haven't confused you with that one. <laughs> it's, it's a very strong argument that our teacher Dol Popa made, you know. There were people, they still are, who believe that the ultimate truth is that nothing is real. If you accept that, which has a lot of philosophical problems, even uttering it is a contradiction, right? The ultimate truth is that nothing is. Well, then what about your ultimate truth? Is that also not true, right? But let's let that one fly for a while, right? What is the problem? If there is no ultimate truth beyond this appearance, then this appearance is all there is. In other words, this appearance is ultimate. There's nothing else but this. That's why all nihilists sooner or later end up in politics, environmentalism. That's, this is it. This is all there is. There's nothing else, according to their wrong view. So we might as well make the best of it. And you're going to either make the best of it by getting control, right? <laughs> <laughs> or by, you know, being a goody-goody. <laughs> but there's not much else, right? That's the problem with nihilism. It leads to utter materialism. And then the final stanza is about this little instruction. Conduct is always important. <laughs> and here we have a beautiful, traditional uh, image, actually, spoken by the Buddha himself, as the wheel follows the ox that pulls the cart, <laughs> right? You have that image, you know, there's an ox, it's pulling the, the cart, and the wheel follows the ox. If the go, ox goes right, the wheel goes right. All my thoughts, words, and deeds have consequences, right? And it's in that way, right? If the ox turns right, the wheel will turn right. The wheel is not going to turn left. If the ox goes forward, the wheel will go forward. If the ox goes back, and they actually do, right? <laughs> the wheel will go back. So this is the teaching of karma, is that everything has a consequence, but it is a consequence that is consonant with the original act. If I throw water on the ground, the ground is not going to get dry. It's going to get wet, right? The result is consequent or consonant with the action. Bless me to keep my view as high as a white-tailed eagle's. A white-tailed eagle is one of the birds of Tibet and one of the highest flying of them all. It's actually a very beautiful bird it has a white tail. It's an eagle. It's a relatively small eagle with a white tail. Right? It flies very, very high. And my conduct, so the view, you know, so it means, you know, you have to have a dispassionate view, not really fall for anything as like, oh, this is so important, this is a, you know, keep a very high view. And my conduct, as careful as a blind man's, on a steep mountain trail. How do you think a blind man would go about uh, moving you know, on a steep mountain trail? Word of them already. <laughs> With extreme care, right? Because if you don't see where you're going and, uh, you know, you're bound to fall. So it would be extremely careful. So we have to have both simultaneously, a very high view. In other words, don't give credence to things. Don't reify situations or people or objects. Don't fall for the appearance. But at the same time, behave with extreme care. So that just because something is not real does not mean it's not important. Somebody is suffering may ultimately not be real. But it does not mean the cause of their suffering may not be real, but their suffering is at this moment. So you have to behave with extreme care. 
And some people fall into antinomianism. Antinomianism is a belief that, well, you know, from the highest point of view, there is no, you probably have read this, there is no good, there is no evil, there is no right, there is no wrong. And yeah, from the highest point of view, there isn't. But we're here now. And we have to behave with great care. My teacher used to say, because you do encounter these people, particularly you know, in Cambridge, there's a lot of people who believe they are intellectual. <laughs> they usually go to Harvard. <laughs> and they actually, you know, it's funny. And I, I'm sorry about it, but it's my observation. I lived in that area for 20 years. I have never heard anyone else begin a comment by saying, I went to Harvard or I go to Harvard and then say what they're going to say, as if that you know, gives it solidity. <laughs> There's a lot of universities there and nobody else says, you know, I go to Tufts. No. Mm -hmm. But anyway, a lot of these people would come up and argue like, you know, it's not really important, uh, you know, why, why do you care so much? For example, my teacher was very, very strongly advocating uh, not harming animals. And, um, you know, some of these people say, well, you know, what difference does it make? You know, that ultimately they're, they don't exist as we see them, and we don't exist as we see them. My teacher would say, I will accept your position if you allow me to slap you and it does not hurt. <laughs> In other words, don't make it just words. If I can slap you and it doesn't hurt, then you can behave that way. But if it hurts, and especially if you get angry because I slapped you, then you're not ready for that high view. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Another thing that we would say was, then give me all your money right now. It doesn't matter. You hold it, I hold it. It doesn't matter. Give it all to me, now. <laughs> oh no, I can't, oh, it makes a difference, doesn't it? We live in the phenomenal world, we live in the world of duality. While we are here, we need to be extremely careful with our conduct because we can and we do harm others. We harm ourselves too. So high view, Careful conduct. Both are necessary. Questions, comments. This is a so it's not such an unapproachable prayer, is it? It's it's fairly straightforward once we once we know what it is. What well, again? What was the term that you can use for that describe that particular attitude you're just talking about? Antinomianism, they call it. Antinomianism. Uh, which has been very prevalent uh, in some Christian sects. Uh, also, uh, in Japan, it's relatively recent, some of the followers of Shinran, who was a great Buddhist teacher, actually came to the conclusion that since uh, the, the promise of Amideva, the primal vow right, saved even great sinners. They should become great sinners in order to be saved, which is a very interesting understanding, right? Or some people actually in Christianity say, you know, the more fallen you are, right, the more grace you will receive. So let's, you know, let's roll in the mud with the pigs. <laughs> That's antinomianism, right? the belief that, you know, we deserve grace by being fallen. Then why did they waste any time teaching? We do that spontaneously, right? <laughs> we do it spontaneously. We have a saying in Spanish, bajando hasta las calabazas ruedan. Right? Downhill, even pumpkins will roll. <laughs> you know, it's not, uh, it's not a big deal. You don't have to have, you know, you, what virtue is there in going down? 
There is none whatsoever. You can roll down. Yes. I'm very curious because in Christianity they say that it's not the virtue to be fallen down, but to come and to confess about it. And when you confess about it, even so the person could be a murderer, whatever horrible person, then he or she will still receive a grace because God loves him. And I was always wondering where is the karma because, you know, it's still... Yes, but, you know, there's a catch there. Remember, I... You know, I, I was a Christian monk, and uh, one of the preliminaries of confession is the uh, determination not to repeat the sin. But people, um, uh, right, people, um, you know, put that aside. You know, they, they actually confess exactly the same thing every week. I know too many awful people who said, I said I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Bang. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, no, no. Part of, well, in Buddhism there is confession too, but, you know, one of the four factors is regret. You actually have to have regret, and regret doesn't mean I feel bad. Regret means that's not good for me. That's what regret means. Right? The, the classic explanation is regret is like when you drink poison and you become aware that you have drunk poison, you want to get it out. That is regret. Or when your hair is on fire, you try to put it out. That is regret. <laughs> right? It's not like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> But I'll do it again next week. <laughs> no. Yes. But so many people still lie and they regret and then they sometimes even cry and then they repeat the same action. So regret is present. Maybe even determination to not repeat is present and yet they still sleep in the... If it is true, if it is true, because some people are good actors and they even fool themselves, sure. right? But if it's true and it's possible, right? Then actually that's indicative that there is a very strong karmic formation. Uh, they need to work on purification, right? Because there are very, very strong karmic formations that some of us have, right? And sometimes, you know, we know that. We know there are some things that we don't really pay too much attention to. We just pretend. But there are some things that we may actually pay a lot of attention to doing, and we can't. We can stop something. That means that there is a strong karmic formation, and we need help. If we can't do it after repeatedly and honestly and sincerely trying, it means we need help. Not because somebody else is going to do it for us. We need help figuring out maybe a different approach. Your explanation sounds like it would really apply to addictions. Yes. Yeah. That's the first thing I thought of when she was talking too. It seems to be very apt. Yes, a, an addiction is a very strong karmic formation. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. And actually, there's a lot of very wrong approaches in today's dealing with addiction. <clears throat> One of them is that we tell people with very good intentions, you know, you made a very bad decision at some point to start using and now you can make a good decision and stop. There's a problem with that. What you've done, what you've done is you've told them that they're incapable of making good decisions. So why are they going to start now making good decisions? In fact, I worked at a health center and we used to take a very different approach. We used to tell them, you made the best decision you could make at that time in the limited <coughs> circumstances that you had. That was the best decision. Now your circumstances are different, your options are different, and again you will make the best possible decision. But it's also very true, it is true. because if you, it's like telling a kid, you know, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, now study hard. 
<laughs> Which we do too. We do that all the time. You're so stupid, you have to study harder. You know how many parents tell their, you know, if you were bright, you wouldn't have to study so much, but you're stupid. And then, you know, what is the child going to learn? Well, he learned that he's stupid. That's all he will learn. So we need to make sure it's not rephrasing or reframing. It's remember, all sentient beings have Buddha nature. It's our problem if we don't see it. We have a dear friend who comes to the Spanish language Sangha, who's been a child psychologist for years and years and years, and she doesn't deal with, you know, children who have problems with their pet poodles. You know, uh, she deals with children with very, very serious problems. And she'll tell you, she was telling us the other day, she has never seen a bad child. A lot of people have told her, this child is very bad. She says, I've never met a bad child. She doesn't see them that way, and they don't act that way with her. They don't. He says, you know, this is the child that was supposed to be bad. People were warning me, be careful, he's going to kill you. He said, I've never met that bad child yet. When, if we can't see, and everybody's Buddha nature is just trying to get out right, from under those veils, we just have to find it. It's there. Natural perfection, that's what it means. It's natural. It's there. We just have to find where it is easier to peel off the veil. And, you know, insulting someone is not the right approach. Offending someone, not the right approach. Now we have the seeds. And when we do these behaviors, they get better. Yes. And they get really bad, they make an impression. And now we're reversing that. So I'm trying to get the seeds to weigh less. <laughs> yes. Less. We're drying them. We're drying the seeds. Will the impressions then go back? Yes. They disappear. A revolution at the base. Okay. Literally, we get rid of all the seeds and the formations. Because they're, excuse me, they're incidental. Meaning they have nothing to do with our nature. It's not part of us. So, if we recover what and who we are, there's no seeds there. There's no formations. There's no impressions. There's just true purity, true self, true bliss, true permanence. That's it. And of course, the thousands upon thousands of qualities, positive qualities that come with those four fundamental marks of Buddha nature. But that is the nature of every single person, animal, insect, fish, sentient beings. You know that in Buddhism we make the distinction between sentient beings and living beings. All sentient beings are living beings. Not all living beings are sentient. Sentient means that they have the capacity of self-awareness. So plants, in your in y'all's view, are, not are living but not sentient, which actually is a great relief because we would not be able to eat <laughs> if they were sentient. We would only be able to be fruitarian if they were truly sentient, but they're not. They're living, but not sentient. Which doesn't mean we should abuse them, right? They feel pain, and this is, they feel pain, but they're not aware that they feel pain. So we should be compassionate because they do feel pain but they are not aware that they feel pain. There's a difference. We can perceive it, but they can't. I know the scientists have done studies. Yes. Yeah. The they move away from things that are harmful yeah. and move towards, but, it's, but they do not have the thought, I move away, or I approach. And how do we know that? 
Well, this is one of the things that we accept because the Buddha was right about every other thing that he said. <laughs> it's more reasonable to accept his view than not. And actually, modern science kind of confirms that. In fact, um, a lot of people would have said until very recently that insects were not sentient. And Buddhism has been saying for 2,600 years that they are sentient. And now they accept that. They are sentient, right? They actually are aware of themselves. Um, even very tiny organisms that the Buddha said are sentient have been confirmed to be sentient. But plants, they have no... Um, it's called self, uh, self-awareness. They don't, they don't have awareness of themselves. They are more like collective beings. What is the uh, saying that you just mentioned about emptiness? You said something about Ah, the superior Nagarjuna said, emptiness cures all wrong views, but the view of emptiness is incurable. So emptiness is a remedy. Right? It literally means whenever something strikes you as being real, you have to apply the analysis. Right? Is it permanent? Is it substantial? Is it independent of all the things, causes and conditions? And if it does not withstand analysis, it's not real. And by the way, nothing that we perceive is substantial because the only thing we perceive is our perception. Our perception is not substantial. My perception of that wall is not substantial. Uh, whether the wall is or not is another question, but my perception of the wall is insubstantial. It's a mental, internal mental representation. Nothing phenomenal withstands analysis. That is applying emptiness as a remedy. And it's fantastic. That's why we said in a previous prayer, right? It's the ultimate remedy. What, whenever you, you are obsessed with a thing, a person, or a situation, do the analysis. See if it withstands analysis. I guarantee you, it doesn't. The new iPhone will not withstand analysis. It will not. But wouldn't gravity be substantial? Your remember, it's your perception. You have no direct contact with anything except through your internal mental representation. We're not talking about whether it exists objectively outside or not, but your experience of it is an internal mental representation. My experience of this table is my perception. It's completely mental. Completely mental. That's why two people can touch the same thing and one say, oh, it's so soft, and the other says, it's soft. <laughs> it's not soft, right? Because it really has nothing to do with the surface. It's your perception. We do it with people all the time. Oh, she's so beautiful. Beautiful. Look at her. If those qualities were inherent in the person or the object or a situation, all of us would perceive the same one. But no, we each have our own perception because they're internal, subjective, mental representations of everything. Even the temperature, right? Some of us here are hot. Some of us are cold. It's supposedly the same temperature, but... LeBron James and I have a different interpretation of gravity. Yes, very different. And there's some uh, martial artists who have a much more different interpretation. I'm not talking about the flying with cables type of martial arts, but I've seen martial artists climb outside walls, you know, of buildings, right? uh, in apparent disregard of the laws of gravity. <laughs> right? uh, I was surprised. Yes. That there was so much emphasis on the, this promise of the pure land. Yes. 
you know, we hadn't talked about it for a while, and now it's, it's like very, you know, prominent here. And it's like less about Buddha Shakyamuni, but more about Amideva. But like, mm -hmm. my concept of Amideva is so, you know, not very concrete at all. Well, <laughs> yes, uh, but actually, he, this uh, emphasis on the name has been there in many of our prayers, at least in two more that I can remember. And I may not have realized we were talking about Amideva. Yes. Remember that Amideva is Buddha nature. Right? So the Buddha in Buddha Shakyamuni is Amideva. Right? Uh, before that, he was Siddhartha Gautama. When the Buddha Amideva manifested fully in Siddhartha Gautama, then we knew him as the Buddha. Um, it is always Amideva. Amideva is a primordial Buddha. But so, no uh -huh. who actually chose. Not historical, no. This was this the Western mind. We want to know the history. No. You know? But, I mean, but Ten eons ago. <laughs> And you know how a neon is defined? It's an undefinable number of years. <laughs> so, ten in definitions ago. Right? The story has been written down and lost, I'm sure. No, no, the story's there. It's, it's, in, the, it's in the long uh, Amideva Sutta. The whole story of uh, the Buddha Dharmakara, of course. It specifies more his 48 vows than anything else. Um, but uh, remember in Tibet in particular, all the schools, um, which does not happen in other, in other Buddhist areas, traditionally Buddhist areas, all the schools of Buddhism in Tibet practice powa, right? Uh, powa means trans uh, transference at death. And all of the powa practices are Amideva-centered. So all of the Tibetan schools have a pure land component. Some are stronger than others, but all of them have it. Uh, for example, you have schools of Buddhism in China that do not have a pure land component or in Japan, that do not have a pure land component. Right? And certainly those in Sri Lanka do not. Right? But in Tibet, all of them do. And our school in particular has a stronger pure land component than most others. Fortunately. <laughs> so the, the emphasis on the promise is actually, we, we've had other prayers which speak very, very strongly about uh, remembering the Buddha, right? which is that. It is the easiest form of spiritual cultivation to remember our own nature. Actually, other forms are indirect ways of remembering our nature. Uh, we even spoke of um, uh, recall. Sometimes I, I know I taught this in Span in the Spanish language, but I don't know if here. The word in Spanish for recollect or remember is recordar. Uh, you have the word in English, right? The core. You have the word uh, cordial. It all refers to the heart. Recordar in Spanish means bring back to the heart, bring back to the center. It, it is the same idea. Remember, recollect means to uh, make it present in the heart. Right? So to remember the Buddha is to remember your Buddha nature, is to make it present in your heart. To understand that what you believe yourself to be right now is actually a superimposition and not a particularly a complementary one. 
complementary one, right? It's not particularly complementary. Uh, we're all much, much better than this. <laughs> There's a study, you probably saw it. Um, they asked women to describe themselves, and then they had these forensic artists, you know, people who do uh, sketches of criminals, so they're very accurate. And uh, they asked women to describe themselves, and these forensic artists would draw them under the supervision of the women, right? And in every case, they were uglier than they were. They saw themselves as uglier than they were. Right? All the people would see them and say, that's not you. That's not you. Yeah. That's not you. So even in conventional ways, we put ourselves down. I had a dear friend years and years and years ago who was a very good opera singer. He made a fantastic career in Vienna at the State Opera. And they insisted that he record uh, Andrea Chenier, which is a very difficult opera. And he played the fundamental role, and it was a Deutsche Grammophon. Those of you who are into Deutsche Grammophon is like, you know, the standard of excellence. It was a Deutsche Grammophon recording. It sold very well. He could not listen to it because he thought he sounded, I think he called himself like a bleating sheep or something. <laughs> <laughs> he could never listen. Everybody else who heard it thought he sounded great. Alejandro Vasquez. He couldn't hear it. We do that to ourselves. How many people, you know, don't like their own pictures and all that thing? Oh, but you look so cute here. Oh, no, it's horrible. Or people hear their own recordings. And say, Ugh. Right? <laughs> and other people like it. So that's just a very, very, very minor indication of the fundamental truth that you are, you are perfect. Right? Om Swabhava. Shuddha Sarva Dharma Swabhava Shuddha Ham. Om, all is pure as it really is. We are pure as we really are. So don't sell yourself short. Also, don't pretend that you're a Buddha right now. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the first to tell you, no. <laughs> But well, that is our true nature, right? And we, it is the easiest way to recover our true nature is to remember it. Like the little lion in the Lion King. <laughs> right? So this promise of Amideva is very central. Because basically, and this is a teaching of Shakyamuni, a lot of people say like, well, aren't you putting the accent on another Buddha? aren't we in this era of Shakyamuni Buddha? Well, Shakyamuni Buddha is the one who gave us a teaching on Amideva. And he gave us that teaching precisely because we are in the age of the five corruptions. And other methods, we're not saying they're impossible, but they require a level of effort and dedication and time that is very often beyond our possibility. I don't want to discourage you, and you know, meditating 10 minutes a day, 5 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day is fantastic. It's wonderful. It will do magnificent things for you. But it's not going to get you enlightenment in one lifetime. It's not. You're spending, if you meditate 20 minutes a day, it means that you are spending 23 hours and 20 minutes not meditating. <laughs> so we need the swift yoga. Yoga means union. The swift process. The swift process is to remember our own Buddha nature. 
And some people then go into the thing like, well, should we remember purely? Or, you know, or we should avoid remembering when we're, uh, when our mind is scattered. Actually, then we would never remember, right? Our minds are always scattered. Remember now. Remember always. Because it is already there. You don't have to create it. If you had to like imagine it and create it, then you would need a lot of concentration. But it's already there. Imagine that you know, uh, you know if let's say that you know that every good friend of yours is in the next room, right? Like how concentrated do you have to be to call out to your friend? Not very. Right? However, if your friend weren't there and you had to like, oh, let me see. I have to focus on my attention and send a message to find him and bring him here. That would be, well, probably useless, but <laughs> but it would take much more concentration. No, but your friend is right there. So your Buddha nature is right there. You know, there is no need to be like, you know, frowning. I always tell people when I do a directed meditation, all, all of you who... I don't, smile, right? There's no reason to frown while you meditate. <laughs> smile, right? Frowning actually damages meditation. Smile. It's more according to your nature to smile than to frown. It feels better too. I can't imagine. <laughs> and there's some people who meditate like that. <laughs> you see pictures even in so-called yoga magazines. Oh, rest your hands easily and smile. <laughs> even if you don't, you know, go to very deep, at least you won't have created wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments? It's amazing how I feel like a lot of times portions cover everything. <laughs> yes, portions do. Yes, the last prayer we had a line right it said, uh, "Bless me to know that gratitude is wisdom, and effort is compassion." We could remember that alone. If you're grateful, that is wisdom. You're constantly grateful, really, truly grateful. And if you're making effort, effort what? Effort in the Dharma, effort at spiritual cultivation, that is compassion. At the very least, you're removing the harm that you would have done from the world. At best, you're actually helping to add happiness, right? But at the very least, you're not adding to the suffering. And that is a big contribution. Big contribution. Right? So gratitude is wisdom, and effort is compassion. So, you know, depending on where we are, some of these lines will strike us as, ah, oh, uh-huh. And that is the purpose, you know, because the things that touch us go deeper. That's why these things, in our lineage, we practice them as prayers. Because, frankly, you can study, you know, we, we could have taken the text, the root text, and said, Instruction 20 says, right? And we could read the instruction, which is very dry. Practice the five strengths during life. Instruction <laughs> the next instruction, practice the five strengths in death. <laughs> instruction 21, conduct is always important. It's not going to move us. That's not cultivation, that's not even seed planting. It's, it's throwing spaghetti against the wall. <laughs> Most of it will not stick. <laughs>
<laughs> so please let us dedicate. By the merit I grew through all our virtual acts, may all be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all embrace happiness and the causes of happiness. May all abide in peace free from self-grasping. May all attain the union of wisdom and compassion. Om Ah Om Soha. May what we're about to do yield favorable results, may give us the capacity to benefit others, may it help us overcome ignorance and limitation, may clear away all obstacles on the path, may lead us to the union of wisdom and compassion. Om Ah Om Soha. I bow to the Lord of Compassion. Without faith in the teacher, I have no guide. Without faith in the Buddha, I have no shelter. Without faith in the Dharma, I have no path. Without faith in the Sangha, I have no support. Without faith in the promise, I have no assurance of victory. When faith is undefiled, the mind is pure. Obliterating pride, it is the root of reverence and the foremost possession in the treasury of Dharma. Bless me to have the faith that is clear wisdom. If I do not practice with constancy and fervor, my formations will bind me to the cycle of suffering. If I do not recite the name with eagerness and gratitude, I will die in anxiety and oppressed by regret. Bless me to cultivate the effort that avoids, the one that overcomes, the effort that develops, and the one that sustains. If I do not remember the instructions of my teachers, I will stumble and fall on the path of perfection. If I do not recall the mind of renunciation, I will fall in the pit of delusion and sorrow. Bless me to keep in mind the ground, the path, and the result. If I scatter my thoughts, the arrow of my bow will miss its target. If I squander my time in secondary practices, death will find me unsettled. Bless me to live with the mind of enlightenment and die with the holy name. If I live with a view of existence, I will collect shadows. If I die with a view of non-existence, I will stumble in darkness. Bless me to know the emptiness of the dependent and the unhindered plenitude of natural perfection. As the wheel follows the ox that pulls the cart, all my thoughts, words, and deeds have consequences. Bless me to keep my view as high as a white-tailed eagle's, and my conduct as careful as a blind man's on a steep mountain trail. So just a reminder that um, these verses are in explanation of uh, mind training instructions 19 through 21 the 19th instruction is to practice the five strengths during life the 20th is to practice the five strengths at death and the 21st is that conduct is always important now, what are the five strengths? They are faith, effort, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. But well, they have different specific meanings during regular life. 
and at the moment of death. So during most of life, we cultivate faith in the three jewels, effort in practice, mindfulness of the Dharma, concentration on enlightenment, and the wisdom of emptiness, emptiness of the phenomenal world. At death, the practice of the five strengths implies faith in vows, effort in recitation, mindfulness of definitive aspiration, concentration on the holy name, and the wisdom of Buddha nature. It is interesting that I read many uh, books and commentaries on on mind training that actually do not make the distinction of the five strengths in during life and death. And uh, they actually don't go into explaining why there is the instruction two times. Practice the five strengths during life, practice the five strengths at death, and many just say, well, it's just you don't forget, well, you're dying. Um, <laughs> for a text that is so condensed, it would not make sense to do that, right? They could have just said, make it one instruction, say practice the five strengths all the time, or during life and death. But actually, it's two different instructions. It's two different instructions because there's two different applications of the five strengths. So in this prayer, we're covering both. And in our previous session, we talked about faith, and we talked about practice. Uh, now uh, we're going to talk about mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Now, uh, we've spoken about this uh, in many different other opportunities, but we have to, again, approach the issue of what is mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness is the relatively poor English translation of the Sanskrit smriti. And smriti means recollection, remembrance. It does not mean attention. Uh, there are other words for attention. Smriti is not one of them. Smriti means to remember. And specifically in the Buddhist context, it means remember the instructions on what to adopt and what to avoid. And that is the meaning of mindfulness. Unfortunately, it has become sort of like a, a fad. We have all sorts of mindfulness training in this, mindfulness training in that, um, mindful eating, mindful this, mindful that. And yeah, I mean, you can have mindful eating, but it does not mean that you're chewing um, your food with gusto. Right? Mindful eating, there is mindful eating, but it means that you remember what you should eat and what you should not eat, <laughs> when you should eat and when you should not eat. Right. And for what purpose? Isn't yes. it also when uh, you're practicing mindful eating that you're, um, you know, I, I've heard that the, the first bite is dedicated to the Buddha, the second bite is dedicated to the Dharma, and so it becomes part of your practice and you're eating in remembrance as you... You're, you're eating word. with purpose. The specifics of how, I mean, it's done different in different lineages, but... Yes, there's, there's when, what, and why. Okay. Always. That is mindfulness. Not, you know, being obsessive about, you know, how am I moving the thing? And, you know, and, you know when do I lift the spoon and when do I set it down? Um, no, it is what you eat, when you eat, and why you eat. Right? Um, 
and actually the definition of why you eat is to keep body and mind together. Um, what is uh, what is appropriate for your species at the time <laughs> right. and when is when it is not a cause of inconvenience for others but that's just as an example right so mindfulness means recollection of instructions that's why when we go to this uh, verse here he says, I do not remember the instructions of my teachers. I will stumble and fall on the path of perfection. So this is mindfulness during life is to recall the instructions that we have received. Why else would we seek instruction? Um, not to accumulate knowledge accumulated knowledge that is not utilized is actually not only a waste of time, it becomes a heavy burden. What do you do with all that knowledge <coughs> in your memory? It actually very often becomes a cause of pride or a cause of self-recrimination. You're not planning to do something. Why learn how to do it? <laughs> because then the only two options that you have, if you're not really practicing, is you're proud that you know how to do something that you don't do, or you regret the fact that you've wasted your time learning something that you're not doing. Particularly with spiritual instruction, that is the case. There are many people who are extremely learned, who know, I, I actually once ran into a, a monk in India who would often tell others, I have forgotten more scripture than you will ever learn. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. I mean, he could recite tomes of scripture um, the fact that he was proud of it well, was a, a giveaway that he was not practicing much of it um, but that's neither here nor there it becomes a burden knowledge that is not utilized becomes a burden and in particular right this is referring to my teachers now no one is your teacher because they have a title of teacher. In our lineage, it's very interesting that uh, you know other lineages give academic titles to people, and uh, and even the title of lama, the title of, of you know spiritual teacher or dharma teacher. And in our lineage. Um, you do need authorization to teach. But you're only a Lama when somebody calls you a Lama. <laughs> you have authorization to teach, and you may start teaching, but you're not a teacher until somebody says you are. Yes. Doesn't no that sense. make sense? Yes. Or it's, you know, like... It's like you cannot be somebody's girlfriend because you decide... <laughs> that you are, right? <laughs> Somebody has to actually think you are. <laughs> you know, sometimes we, we miss kind of um, fairly evident stuff, right? <laughs> well, I am in my mind. Uh, no. Somebody has to actually think. So... Uh, I bring that up because when we say, if I do not remember the instruction of my teachers, it means you have accepted these personalities <laughs> as your teachers. What does that mean? It means you should have done some investigation, you should have done some analysis, and you have found their teaching sincere and helpful, and you have taken instruction, 
and then you don't follow it, that is actually not that you're breaking a commitment to the teacher. You're breaking a commitment to yourself. Remember that the Dharma is concerned with liberation from suffering. So the source of suffering for every sentient being is his or her own mind. That is the source of suffering. May, may I make a comment on that sure. as well? Um, in, in taking the teacher's instruction, in my own practice and path, I I've <laughs> have to admit that sometimes it takes a little longer than the day he shares it. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and so... <laughs> repetition <laughs> is quite helpful and, and sometimes it takes a little longer and then I'll, I'll see that it starts to manifest and, and, and uh, soften that groove, so to speak, of the habitual self. So, you know, taking that instruction doesn't always show itself quickly. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But uh, here, remembrance of the instruction is you, you actually, however long it takes, you know, mm -hmm. um, but that you remember it, mm. because if you've accepted it, why, why not? And the point that, that I was driving at is that it's not that the teacher gets offended. Mm. Who cares, right? I, I mean, if all my uh, math teachers became offended by what I remember now of math, <laughs> oh, they would be sad people. Uh, right? <laughs> I actually strove to forget as soon as I took the test. <laughs> it's not my favorite subject. What, it, what the problem with not applying, not remembering the instruction of our sp spiritual teachers mm -hmm. is that our mind will then be, uh, oh, what is the word in English? Resistant mm -hmm. to spiritual instruction it will actually argue with you. Like, oh yeah, you're going to do it now? Yeah, why didn't you do it before? Yeah. How much have you forgotten? Mm -hmm. How much are you not doing? Right? And uh, self-doubt mm -hmm. becomes extremely established. So it's not that you failed your teacher. It is that your mind now can argue with you whenever you seek to do something. It's the same reason why we don't abandon commitments, because every time you abandon a commitment, your mind has a very powerful argument against anything you want to do. Oh, you want to do that also? Remember when you wanted to do that and you didn't? And you know the mind does that. Right? I mean, I'm sure you have experienced it. I can't be the only one. <laughs> Doesn't your mind remind you of the things that you failed to do before? This is what I was talking about when I was talking about the process. Oh, there yeah. There's all that chatter. <laughs> and, and the mind is, you know, the mind doesn't forget anything. Because it's all there. It's all, you know, every single experience you've ever had is stored in the ground consciousness. The mind can pull out things that, uh, oh, you think that um, you, you're not attached to, you know, this or that, and it brings up an image, and you suddenly go like, oh, <laughs> I still have that, yeah. right? Yeah. I still have that. So the mind is uh, very tricky, right? The mind can be a great friend when it is tame. The mind is the greatest enemy when it is not. So, remember that these instructions are never meant to make you feel bad about what you did to somebody else. Right? Uh, that has its consequences. But the fundamental problem that we have is not with other sentient beings. The fundamental problem that we have is with our own self-grasping and self-cherishing. So during life, if I do not remember the instructions of my teachers during ordinary life, I will stumble and fall on the path of perfection. Right? Because these instructions are meant to help you avoid the most common pitfalls. 
And if you actually get to develop a very close relationship with a spiritual uh, mentor, then, you know, besides the general pitfalls, then you get to identify your specific ones, right? That is what one-on-one -on -one instruction is about, to discuss specific issues that one may have and how to avoid them. Remember that this is a path, Dolpopa called it the path of separation. <coughs> We're not building anything. We're removing we're removing veils, we're removing problems. We are staying away from the pitfalls. That's all we have to do. The, the Buddha nature is already there. So it's actually much easier, but you just have to avoid the, the problems that come up, and in particular, you have to avoid the problems that come up habitually. Now, yes, in general, spiritual teachers will speak about avoiding the three poisons, right? And you get a little bit deeper, and they will speak of avoiding the five poisons, right? Um, and you get a little bit deeper, and they'll talk to you, talk to you about the five precepts, and you know, the ten negative actions, and you, but sooner or later, we have to understand that this, all this teaching, has a personal application. And that the ways in which the three poisons affect me are very different from the way the three poisons affect another, one, another person. For example, let's take aversion. In some people, aversion manifests principally as fear. When you, when you dislike something, there are people who just run away. Other people, aversion manifests as conflict and hatred and opposition, active opposition. And there's all degrees between those polarities of fear and hatred. Attachment is the same thing. For some people, it's, you know, it manifests as I'm going to go and I'm going to get it. For some other people, is that the longing, the wishing. Some people then get into the magic thing of, you know, praying for it or wishing for it or hoping against hope that it will manifest somehow. <laughs> but they're both forms of attachment, and they're both causes of suffering. <clears throat> and indifference, there is willful indifference, there is learned indifference, there is absent-minded indifference. There are all sorts of indifference. And sooner or later, we have to figure out what it is, how it is that these three poisons manifest, and what antidotes work for us. The same antidotes don't work for everybody. For some people, you know, it's head-on confrontation with their problems. Some people, it's not. The more they try to confront something, the more they remember it. So they need another approach. And this is where the specific instructions of a teacher are important. Now, a lot of people also try to jump into this specificity of the Dharma and I think it's, it's a very safe bet to say that we first have to understand the general before we get to the specifics. So we can't really figure out what is my dominant afflicted emotion and how does it manifest until we have a fairly thorough understanding of what the afflicted emotions are. Mm -hmm. So it is very uh, good to study the Dharma first in its general applications. The Buddha literally, right? Mm -hmm. His teaching is divided into the three turnings of the wheel of Dharma because there were three different levels of specificity and this is still in the general. <laughs> so we have to also exercise patience. 
because sometimes we want to, how do I solve this specific problem? Well, maybe if you knew more about the problem in general, you wouldn't even think you have that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe you have another one right? that's more significant than that. So that's during life. Now, at death, what is mindfulness? If I do not recall the mind of renunciation, I will fall in the pit of delusion and sorrow. What is the mind of renunciation? The mind of renunciation is the mind not that rejects things, is a mind that understands, the mind that fully realizes that phenomena cannot make us happy. And that conceptually is very easy to accept. But particularly at the moment of death, the mind of renunciation is important. Why? Because that is what binds us to the cycle of life and death. If while you're dying, you're thinking, but I want five more minutes. I want to see my grandchildren, um, you know, have children. I want to see this. I want to see so-and-so graduate. I want to, uh, if I only had five more minutes to say goodbye to so-and-so. Or, like, Believe it or not, a lot of people are like, what's going to happen to my stuff? <laughs> Who's going to get it? <laughs> and why? <laughs> so it's that revulsion of samsara. It's the yeah, revulsion. you have to actually understand. None of this is going to make me happy. Because if you are thinking of that at the moment of death, that's where you're going. It's not punishment. It's just, is that where you want to go? Let's go. Remember, the mind at the moment of death becomes untethered. There's no anchor. There's no physical anchor. Wherever it wants to go, it will go. So the mind of renunciation is absolutely essential. And the mind of renunciation is almost, it should be at that point in our cultivation, it should almost be passive. Mm -hmm. It's like not interested. That's why, for example, in the dying practices in Buddhism, it is recommended, you know, if you have for, no matter how much they love you, if you have relatives who can't keep calm and your deathbed is better that they not be there, they're going to be there you know, like, like in Kung Fu movies, you know, have you noticed they always scream and shake the person who's dying, like, that's going to help. <laughs> uh, no, if they are going to be screaming and crying their hearts out, you know, go somewhere else. To bring on that kind of, you know, grief and screaming and crying is counterproductive. People should literally go in peace. Isn't that what we say? Mm -hmm. Rest in peace, but let me scream at you a little bit first. <laughs> but maybe, <laughs> make sure that we sob together first. It doesn't mean that you don't have feelings. Right? But the duty of somebody who is assisting, and that's how we should see it, is the duty of someone who is assisting another to die is to make sure that they have the very best conditions for a peaceful exit. We also say, if there's someone they're very attached to, that person should not be in the room. If there's someone that they're very averse to, that person should not be in the room. It is no time to say, you know, long goodbyes. It's no time for asking forgiveness. Oh, that's... <laughs> That's really not the time to do it. I want you to forgive me for all the times that I stabbed you in the back, remember? <laughs> no. Not the time to do that. That's 
dwell there for a moment. <laughs> Not the time to do that. Or, you know, people who, you know, who had that plans, but we had such, you know, plans. We would have been so happy together. Not the time for that either. It's time to move on. And it's certainly not the time for, don't go, don't leave me. What am I going to do without you? You know what you're going to do without that person? What you were doing before. You're going to keep on breathing and you're going to keep on living and you're going to keep on your way. <laughs> That's not being hard-hearted. That's actually being helpful. We are there to help, to assist and to comfort and to maintain peace. If we can't do that, the person's better off with us somewhere else. So we need to recall the mind of renunciation and the moment of death, because otherwise we fall into the pit of delusion. Delusion is the belief that there's something in the phenomenal world that will make us permanently happy. And sorrow, because we are going to be leaving behind that which we deludedly, deludedly thought would make us happy. Right? So both are increased if we do not keep the mind of renunciation. So this verse ends, bless me to keep in mind the ground, the path, and the result. Interesting turn here. Right? Why? What is the ground? The ground is Buddha nature. Mm -hmm. What is the path? The path is the gradual manifestation of Buddha nature. And what is the result? The result is the fully manifest Buddha nature. That is the only constant in both recollection during life and recollection at the moment of death. During the la during regular life, we have to remember what is our nature. It may be veiled, but it is Buddha nature. And that whatever we're doing is either covering it or manifesting it. But that regardless of our present circumstance, we will all fully manifest Buddha nature. And at death, at the moment of death, also we have to remember our nature. Not remember, but, oh, but I have, you know, this, such a cute little kid, and this one and that. No. Remember your Buddha nature. Remember your path at this moment, which is to actually invoke very strongly for your mind's benefit your Buddha nature, and for that we use the holy name. And remember that there is no other destination, no other result. Everything else is a detour. Everything else is a detour. And some of them are very unpleasant. So why would you want to go there? The next Stanza says, if I scatter my thoughts, the arrow of my bow will miss its target. So this is about uh, still about concentration. It is about yeah, concentration. Concentration literally means to keep the mind one pointed right so if we scatter the thoughts whatever our goal may be during ordinary life will not be achievable you don't have this image in in, uh, in american uh, folklore but in, in, in spanish and latin american folklore we have this image of the I don't even know how to translate this, but it's a, a tailor who takes on way too many uh, commissions and never finishes anyone. I, I know what 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, the, they're always taking on work, but they can't finish. <laughs> yeah. right? We say, el sastre embustero, the, the lying tailor, because he ends up lying to everybody. Yes, I will deliver this. Next week, it will be ready. Yeah, right. <laughs> If we live with a scattered mind, we never finish anything. We start this, we start that, we do a little bit of this, we do a little bit of this practice, a little bit of that practice. Oh yeah, that was good, that was interesting, that is sweet. And then we go on to the next one. And we keep going here and there and you know in Tibetan Buddhism it's become fashionable to collect empowerments right and people go well I have this empowerment how many empowerments do you have and I have that one and I can do this practice and that practice and I can do this other practice and then you ask them so how many of them do you do ah, none of them but I have all the empowerments it's like, you know, going and, you know, why would you go out and get licenses to do a lot of things that you don't intend to do? Well, you know, I have a, an electrician's license and a plumber's license and a whatever license, there, but I don't do any of those things. Why get them? Why get them? <coughs> and that's not only with practices, that happens with everything. In life, right? If you start too many things, if your mind is in too many things, if you're texting and driving, right? <laughs> the arrow of your bow will miss its target. <laughs> Whatever it is works better with concentration. This is also referring to the practice of meditation and calming the mind, is it? Exactly. Whatever brings the mind to a state of concentrated rest. Mm -hmm. The second line is literally referring to death, although this has to happen prior to death, but also at death. If I squander my time in secondary practices, death will find me unsettled. Mm -hmm. During our lifetime, we have to develop the mind of renunciation. In fact, we have to develop three minds. The sincere mind, the deep mind, and the mind of aspiration. Um, they have many different names. Uh, Vasubandhu spoke at length what is the sincere mind? The sincere mind is the mind that simultaneously understands I have, I am Buddha nature and I right now have these veils covering. That is true sincerity. It's not, you know, I'm so bad, I'm so bad. No, you're not so bad. You're actually perfect. You're not showing it right now. Right? Sincerity is being able to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. Is that the aspirin? Uh, or bodhicitta or the no not yet this is merely okay. looking right. at things as they are I have Buddha nature and I'm not showing it particularly well mm -hmm. the second mind is a deep mind and the deep mind is the one that recognizes that many Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have turned over their merit for our benefit and that it is there for us to accept and what stops us from accepting it is actually pride the fear of being in someone's Debt. The fear of being subordinated because deep down the mind of every, remember minds are deluded by nature, the individual mind, the mind 
thinks of itself as the supreme entity. The mind thinks, you know, the world turns, mm -hmm. it revolves around me. Isn't that a definition of God? I am the Lord of all that I survey. Everything's about me. Everything. That is the position of the mind. And that is inherent. Right? The moment we take a phenomenal form, that is our point of view. Everything is around me. Just turn around and you'll see. It's all around me. You don't have another perspective. And that's why we have to be very, very adamant in our effort to literally remove that wrong view mm -hmm. through study, through reflection, through analysis, through meditation. The false self <coughs> is a huge impediment. So this mind, this deep mind, is not only, a lot of people think that, oh, it's the mind that accepts grace. You know, in order to accept grace, you have to deal with the fundamental problem, which is that your ego will not allow it. So the deep mind is actually the mind that renounces the ego, that renounces its self-view. And then the third mind is the mind of aspiration. And that is the real and the true bodhicitta. Mm. And the mind of aspiration is the one that says, I have received this grace, this merit turned over to me. And the only way I can reciprocate is to accumulate vast merit and wisdom and turn it over to someone else. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing I can do. There's nothing else you can do. How do you repay the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas? How? They don't need anything. They don't want anything. They're not even accessible to you at this stage to have any kind of interaction. You know, like, hey, here. <laughs> Thanks, guy. Cheers. Um, the only way you can show your appreciation and that you really understand is to accumulate. What did you do? I'm going to do that too. I am going to accumulate merit and wisdom and turn it over freely to all sentient beings. So that's why it says, if I squander my time in secondary practices, death will find me unsettled. If we have not cultivated that process, now specifically at the time of death, right, is not the time to be doing things other than focusing on what? On our own ability to help others. And that has only one word and is enlightenment. We may try now, and we do try, and it's nice. You know, we, we have our little efforts that we can do on behalf of other sentient beings, and that's great, and we should do it because it's cumulative. But the only way we will truly be able to help others is to achieve enlightenment. And at the moment of death, we have the opportunity right there to arise spontaneously in the pure land of bliss and become full Buddhas with all the capacities, the powers, the abilities, the knowledge, the skillful means to help liberate all sentient beings. Tell 
why she is that <clears throat> what you just said is that due in large part because the mind becomes untethered from the body that creates that space for this to happen the gap. it is a great potential and a great danger because it is untethered if you have pure aspiration you have the definitive aspiration mm -hmm. right there's nothing to stop you right. nothing will stop you So yes, it's the same thing. It's no longer anchored. Okay. So if you've cultivated the definitive aspiration, it's called a, this is what we pray. It's right here. Definitive aspiration. Okay. We just recited it. Okay. You know, we slip it into regular practice <laughs> <laughs> so that you know it's there yeah. there's a method to our madness yes you can see it's written all over these two pages <laughs> yes <laughs> it's there it's all there okay. so what does it mean to squander my time in secondary practices there's many things that are nice and pleasant and you know Things and you know, particularly with very ritualistic Buddhists, believe me, at the time of death, there are people who are doing the reordination. <coughs> I mean, my teacher had to endure a three-hour. He he had had a massive, uh, how do you call it, a aneurysm. You could call it that. Okay. And they actually, you know, because it's traditional among. Tibetans, you know, they, they actually held a reordination ceremony for him. Mm -hmm. and endured a three-hour reordination ceremony. Like, why? Why? So, you know, there's... That's one of the things that they're referring here, you know. There's a lot of deathbed rituals that are not helpful and, you know, let's not only think of Tibetan Buddhists. We have a lot of them. We just mentioned some, you know, people filing in and, you know, doing their little weepy thing and saying, forgive me and uh, how much I love you and bringing them. Oh, this is a new one. People are actually bringing now collections of photographs to dying people. Here, in case you're not attached enough okay. to your life, let's look together at the highlights oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. we have a lot of very peculiar deathbed rituals yes right? I've recently uh, attended one with the, the whole slideshow thing yes. and the other one of course that we should not minimize is we have our whole heroic medical ritual which is one of the most damaging things for the mind it's like, we will save you, no matter what. And every time you try to go, we will <coughs> we'll shock the hell out of you and bring you back. And, you know, if that doesn't work, <laughs> you know, we'll open you up and do, you know, direct heart massage. And if that doesn't work, we'll pump you up with adrenaline. And, you know. <laughs> so like, let them go. They're all going to die. Has that not, you know, how far into medical school do you have to go to understand that every patient will die? Is that a mystery? All of them will die. How can you make them as healthy and as comfortable until they do should be the aim of medicine, not like how can we torture them a little bit more during the last few hours? Well, that brings in the cash. And it creates also false expectations, and it creates all sorts of problems. There, there's also that not on my watch kind of mentality. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have the lowest mortality rate of all the residents. Uh, I just broke them in. No, you know, sooner or later, however long you've been a physician, <laughs> the mortality rate for your patients is 100%. Mm -hmm. But that's okay, because that's the rate for everybody else. Mm. Yeah, I, ha I met a 
very interesting old physician in New Mexico when I was in, in school. And uh, and he used to go around saying, I'm a, I'm a failure, all of my patients die. But he was honest, he was not putting himself down, he was trying to teach something, you know, because he taught at the medical school, and there's a lot of people who, you know, go into medical school, like, you know, they're going to, I'm going to, you know, be a researcher, I'm going to defeat this disease, and I'm going to say, I'm, I'm a failure, and I've been a failure <laughs> for 40 years, right? all my patients die. People would be like, oh, don't listen to that guy, he's really bad. I said, no, he's actually very good. <laughs> he's excellent. Right? He's just being honest. You know, take away this illusion. So that is one of the major wasteful, squandering secondary practices that we in the West engage in. We don't give people time to settle spiritually because we are too busy agitating them with the delusion that we're going to save their bodies. And we actually tell them, fight on! Don't give up! Don't we? Oh, yes. We're doing that all the time. We're here for you! You know, just keep on talking. That is squandering your effort. So, this one ends, bless me, to live with the mind of enlightenment and die with the holy name. What is the mind of enlightenment? It's bodhicitta, it's the mind of aspiration, it's a mind that is constantly seeking the welfare of others. That is the ultimate guideline. All the rules and regulations, all the instructions, if we were to boil them down, is benefit others. Benefit others. And what does it mean to die with the Holy Name? Is die remembering your Buddha nature. So live with the aspiration of enlightenment and die with the certainty of enlightenment. This is what it means. While we are in these bodies, enlightenment is approachable but not achievable. There will always be residual karma. The fact that you have a body is evidence that you have residual karma. But you can hold the bodhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. At death, you actually have the ability to spontaneously arise in the pure land. So, live with the mind of enlightenment and die with the certainty of enlightenment. Right there, right then, without going through eons of practice, without going through arduous, you know, lifetimes of cultivation it is your nature why do you have to work so hard at your nature what is you actually what's been hard is to pretend to be what you're not that is why we have such a hard time we're pretending how hard is it for a lion to pretend that he is a lamb. Think about it. It would, you know, the cosmetics alone <laughs> would be. <laughs> the whole wardrobe change. Yes. <laughs> yeah, every time, like, <laughs> no, excuse me, I meant me. <laughs> well, that's what we're doing. Here we are, Buddhas, and we're pretending to be these limited sentient beings with all of these problems. But no, it's it's very hard role to play. 
And but we are extremely good method actors. Yeah. We've gotten into the character and we're gonna play it to the hilt. Reminds me of a YouTube video that I recently saw. It was a somebody filming their cat, and their cat was up at the window, and there there was dogs barking, and so the cat was just in, uh, fascinated by these dogs, and um, it turned around to the camera and was barking, <laughs> 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 and then all of a sudden it went meow. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm a cat. <laughs> We do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> will we finish? Yes, we will finish. Okay, so the next stanza, it's about wisdom. Remember, there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is conceptual. Wisdom Think of, whenever you hear wisdom, think of vision. And vision is different from view, right? A view means an opinion, or a, one way of looking at things. Vision means what's right there. So, if I, if I live with the view of existence, that's the opinion, right? The wrong view. The view of existence I will collect shadows. So what does this mean? If I, if I live as if everything were real, substantial, permanent, independent, I will go from darkness to darkness. I will not be able to remove my afflictions. Everything will be confused, but, but everything is important, you know, when you actually give things importance, we do that, we try to tell our children, you know, when they get very upset about something, as they are wont to do, but we know it's not really important, we try to communicate with them, it's not that important, right? You ever had that experience? Yeah. And we can see clearly it's not really that important. You know, tomorrow you'll be over it. But for the kid, it's like the end of the world. But we're like that too. That is living with the view of existence. Everything is a major problem. Oh, she said that. Did she say that? So what? Words are nothing. We get all upset about what we think people are thinking about us. Now that's that's a real treat, mm. right? So you have like a vaporous thought about somebody's vaporous thoughts <laughs> about you, and you're getting all <laughs> bent out of shape about that. Like the insanity. <laughs> but we do that all the time. Yeah. Everything is like a major drama, everything is like the end of the world, everything is abysmal, and it's in our language too, right? Everything is horrible, it's terrible, I'm starving. Nobody's hungry anymore. <laughs> People are constantly starving, you know, they're... But we're always exaggerating, but that is the tendency mm -hmm. of the view of existence, the view of existence, the view that things are permanent. It's never going to end. And we actually ask that question, when will this end? Right? <laughs> when will it be over? Well, you know, it, it will. It will be over. And the more we worry about when will it be over, the longer it will last in our mind. It's like, you know, you know, if you're on a car trip, asking every two minutes, are we there yet, is going to make it a very long trip. <laughs> Where are we now? Where are we now? Checking the map. Oh, that's unbearable. Just drive. <laughs> you will get there when you get there. Doesn't really make any difference asking, does it? <laughs> it only makes it unbearable. For you and the people around you, so, uh, give uh, others a break, <laughs> and yourself too. 
So that's living with the view of existence. I will collect shadows. There's nothing. Shadows here also means that, you know, can you hold on to shadows? Shadows are not tangible. If you think that things are real, what are you collecting? Lies. Just lies. Now, if you, li if you die with the view of non-existence, you will stumble in darkness. Now, and this is a direct mention of the, the view of emptiness, right? Like we've said many times, and you will hear me say it very often, emptiness cures all wrong views, but the view of emptiness is incurable. Emptiness is a form of analysis that we apply to eliminate the mistake of taking phenomenal objects as real. Right? Emptiness is a process of analysis where we actually ask, is this substantial? No. Is this permanent? No. Is it independent? No. Therefore, I don't really have to worry, do I? But if you turn that into the view that nothing is real. And you bring that onto your death. <clears throat> you will stumble in darkness because it means you have no light for what is coming and you will be scared. Isn't that uh, another way of saying that emptiness is true in a relative sense, but not true in an absolute sense? Dolpopa actually coined the term self-emptiness and other emptiness. Self-emptiness is a fact in the relative world. Like, nothing is independent, substantial, and... Uh, permanent. Then he coined the term, I mean, we use other emptiness in, in English, but the term he uses is shentong, which means emptiness of that which is not real. It means that while we are using our conceptual minds, it is difficult to describe ultimate reality. The best we can say about it is that it is not full of false, impermanent things. It is not full of insubstantialities. It's not full of dependent objects. There is a plenty to there, but we don't know what it is. So we don't make assertions. That's why he preferred the term other emptiness, is ultimate reality. It's empty of all that is not true and real. But what it is, from this conceptual perspective, it is best not to say because we will err. But yes, there is the view of emptiness is wrong. Actually, even applied to the material world, if it's a view, then it becomes an opinion. It becomes a dogma. It is better to have the mind that, as we say also, <laughs> right here, what it says, apprehending whatever exists as existing and whatever does not exist as not existing. Not to be married to one extreme or the other. Actually, that's why it's supposed to be the middle way. We have to go a step further and call it the great middle way because some of the people who follow the middle way and call themselves Madhyamikas, or followers of the middle way, actually have um, veered towards the extreme of non-existence. Right? And Dol Popa's struggle was to bring them back to the center, to a great middle way. Right? Whatever exists should be viewed as existing, and whatever does not exist should be viewed as not existing. If we die with a view of non-existence, remember the view is an opinion, a belief. 
no being, and I use the term in its most pure meaning, being, right? Existence. No existence is ready to deny itself. No being embraces dissolution. If you die with the view of non-existence, Yikes. <laughs> it's suicide. It is spiritual suicide. Of course, nobody is actually capable of doing that. Nobody is that powerful. But there is great suffering. There is great fear that comes with that. So that's why we say, if I die with the view of non-existence, I will stumble in darkness. Right? Darkness is a synonym here for great fear, terror. Like for most people it is, right? Most people are afraid of darkness. Bless me to know the emptiness of the dependent. That the phenomenal world does not exist. And the unhindered plenitude of natural perfection. The scriptures say that the qualities of the Buddhas are more numerous than the grains of sand on the banks of the Ganges. Meaning that we can't quantify them, we can't describe them. We have to merely know that it is not nothingness. But what do we say after that? It's all almost in negative language, unhindered plenitude. Not nothingness. <laughs> There's not very much else we can say. Other emptiness. Emptiness of all that is false. But from this standpoint, it's very difficult to describe. So we know in the sense of conceptually, we have to understand that phenomenal things do not exist as they appear, but that that view cannot be projected beyond the phenomenal world. It does not include natural perfection. And then the final stanza says, as the wheel follows, uh, and by the way, that is about wisdom, right? So now the last stanza is for instruction number 21. Conduct is always important. As the wheel follows the ox that pulls the cart. Interesting choice of image. It's, it may be colorful and traditional, but actually I think the important thing is that it has three parts. The wheel follows the ox that pulls the cart. So there's an ox. The ox is actually not connected to the wheel, right? The ox is connected to the cart, and the cart has wheels. Bear with me. <laughs> All my thoughts, words, and deeds have consequences. Every action that we take, whether it's of mental, verbal, physical, has consequences. We may not see the connection as clearly as when we see an ox pulling a cart and therefore the wheels are moving. But let's take this view, right, of this cart from another sentient being's perspective. A dog, do we really know if the dog sees the whole thing or the dog is just seeing the wheel? In many cases it could just be the wheel. What if it's an insect? What part of that image does one insect capture? See where I'm going? The backside of the ox. 
<laughs> or an ear, or yes. So depending on our perspective, our position, our capacity, we may see an aspect of this. What you know, there could be a what do you call that uh, thing that eats wood? Uh, termites. termites in the cart. What do the current termites know of what's going on? But they're in the cart, on the cart. So regardless of our capacity to make that connection, right? And we always try, oh, why, why did that happen? You know, well, it happened. Right? It's happening. <laughs> whether we understand, whether we see clearly all the connections, all the interrelations, right? the fact is that every act has consequences. And we're trying, you know, for us, uh, an ox cart is not a particularly complex piece of technology, but remember when this was written, this is high complex technology. You know, you can ride a horse without that many contraptions, right? You can actually, they ride uh, yaks. This is a very complex system. I'm not putting them down. I'm trying to make you see that what they're pointing at here, and that's why they use a complex image, is that regardless of whether we can work out or not the complexity of karma, the only thing we really have to understand is that everything has consequences. And the consequences are, remember what we've said many times, there's three things we need to know about karma. The, 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 the nature of the consequence is of the same kind as the act. The magnitude of the consequence is in the beginning as big as the act, actually eventually it's bigger, and the owner of the consequence is the same as the performer of the act. You can't transfer <laughs> it. Here, let me commit this crime and I'll give it over to Colleen. <laughs> and I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That gives me additional card. <laughs> That's all we need to know. People spend a lot of time trying to figure out the complexes. Say, why did she do what she did? And why why did I? Ah. The only thing we need to know is that the nature of the consequences of the same, you know, the kind as the act, the magnitude in the beginning is exactly the same. It will grow if it's not fulfilled, right? And that the owner is the same owner. That's all we need to know. Um, what do you mean it will grow if it's not fulfilled? If you try to avoid the consequences, they actually get worse. Let me give you a very straightforward example, right? If you commit literally a crime, and they're after you, and you run away, right? Then they charge you twice. You know, not only for committing the act, for resisting the arrest, for uh, being a fugitive, it's compounded. Okay? So the same thing with negative karma. If we don't accept the responsibility of our karma, right, then we have the additional karma of avoiding it, the karma perhaps of blaming someone else. The, so we compound it. It's not that magically it just, you know, sprouts. <laughs> Is that as with everything else, if we don't accept responsibility for something and we keep covering up, then we have the crime of covering it up. And that usually implies lying, it implies you know, blaming somebody else, it implies trying to shift responsibilities. There's so many other things that we do in order to not accept responsibility of our actions. And that's how it grows and it grows and it grows. And you can see it with self-awareness, or I, I've seen it in my own life with self-awareness, uh, um, that what starts out to be a very, very small issue gets, you know, a lot 
there's a laboration. You know, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it becomes a, a pattern. So, you know, you can kind of see these things <laughs> unfold after a while. Well, that's why the Buddha said, you know, a small spark can start a very large fire. Yes. How does uh, like doing things that are supposed to help clean your clear your karma? Mm -hmm. How does that play into? It's a way of accepting responsibility. You see, the karma is karma is not punitive. There's not somebody out there saying like, you know, you owe this much. So if we have done something <laughs> negative, the only thing we really can do is do something positive. <laughs> if you have a bank account and you've overdrawn it, the only thing that you can do to solve that problem is make a deposit. Pay the fine. Stop drawing down. That's all. Right? There's no big mystery. It's like the more we have, that's why we talk about accumulating merit, which are good actions, right? and wisdom. Wisdom to avoid making the same mistake. Accumulate merit and wisdom. That's the only thing that we can do to purify our karma. There's no magic. No magic. We have rituals of karma purification, but they are skillful means to accumulate merit and wisdom. That's all they are. That doesn't make them lies. It's all that we all make, oh, they're skillful means. That doesn't mean they're lies. They are skillful means. <laughs> you know, use them. But they are not magical things. You know, nobody's waving and magic wand and making the bad karma go away. No, you are accumulating merit and wisdom. Your desire to participate in a ritual, for example, your, your willingness to spend the time and the effort that it takes is accumulating merit and wisdom. And that, it's, it's like making a deposit in an overdrawn account. You know, and sooner or later, if you keep making deposits and not taking so much out, you will have a positive balance. That's all it is. Kind of reminds me of the serenity prayer. You know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Reminds me of that. Mm -hmm. So we have to, we have to continuously, right, be aware of what all my thoughts, words, and deeds have consequences. If we actually were a little bit more aware of consequences, we would spare ourselves a lot of problems. If you were really aware of consequences, would you really have said that to that person? Would you have hit send to that email? Would you, know, would you have signed that contract? We, you know, most of our mistakes come from getting excited about something and not considering the consequences. That's what education is all about, right? Or should be about. Learning to follow through logically and considering the consequences. That's why good chess players, right? What defines a good chess player? And I'm not one of them. <laughs> to be able to... See, you know, what are the possible consequences of moving here? What will they do? What will I do? What will? That's just consequences. That's all that strategy is. It's a consideration, formal consideration of consequences. I understand. I think what you're saying about consider consequences, but. I've also experienced in doing that sometimes it keeps me from being spontaneous in the present moment. Please forgive me, but being spontaneous in the present moment is not particularly beneficial. It's highly overrated. <laughs> it, it, well, it's not beneficial. It's, it's something that is cultivated in the new age, like, you know, be, no, that is our problem. Children are spontaneous in the present moment, and what do they do? They get into trouble constantly. That's why they need adults around. 
we actually need to be mindful. We need to be sober. Right? If I do this, what is the possible consequence? And we wouldn't get into so much trouble. Yeah, but the Buddha, I mean, I'm not it, disputing let, uh-huh. that, but the Buddha says don't live in the past and don't live in the future, live in the present moment. Yes. And I, I think mean, we get confused. In the present the moment, moments. the consequences are present. The consequences don't come later. This is what I've been trying to convey, and I don't think I'm doing such a good job. The consequences of karma don't come later. They are immediate, right? You've changed your mind the moment you do something, right? Uh, we have this time lapse view of the world. Everything is happens instantaneously, right? So when you perform an act, it's done, and the consequence is there. When you notice the consequence is something else. The consequence is there. So living in the present does not militate against considering the consequences because your consequences are right there and then. It's not that you did this and then tomorrow the consequences will catch up with you. Like, to give a very terrible example, but if I kill someone now, it's not that tomorrow I'll be guilty of murder. I'm guilty of murder the moment I kill the person. I become a murderer there and then, not later. Not when the court finds me guilty. It's when I kill the person. That is just an effect, a secondary effect of this situation now. So I'm not saying, you know, measure everything, although actually that's preferable. <laughs> but, but be aware, just be aware that things have consequences. And actually, yes, in the beginning it will make us more reserved. And that's not a bad thing. It is not a bad thing. The middle way is about cultivating peace. And peace is neither excited nor depressed. It's calm. It's calm. It's like there's nothing really to get that excited about in either direction. Just so it is. It is. Remember, you know, we love, particularly in the West, we love excitement, right? But whatever comes up, whatever goes up, what's the rest of the phrase? Must come down. There's even a song about that. Mm -hmm. The the word bliss um, and the word joy, you know, those are words that people use in spirituality a lot, you know? Um, And I don't think that you're saying that those things need to be absent, but that they arise from something different from what we would normally think. It's, yeah, they are words that are specifically chosen in spirituality so that, because nobody goes around saying like the bliss of disco, Mm -hmm. right? Or the bliss of, uh, I don't know, six flags. (laughs) We use those words particularly to differentiate it, it actually comes from peace. It does peace. not come from excitement. And the joy of, of uh, studying the Dharma, for example, that, that joy that... Uh, it's light. That is. It's yeah. not... Yeah, it's yeah. not jumpy. Yeah. Right. And we have... Uh, we have great attachment to excitement, right? Mm-hmm. We find things boring. Constantly very Oh, we did that already. We have to do that again. And, you know, we, we love innovation. There's a, a billboard on the way here that says, we are driven by innovation. <laughs> oh, I don't want to be in the hands of those people. <laughs> and they're going to try new things on me? And no, thank you. Right? <laughs> we love that, you know, the newness of it. And that is self-defeating. Because what is really new there? I, I tell you, I've lived in various continents in many countries and sooner or later you find out it's all the same there are people there is ground (laughs) there are animals there are insects and some days are good and some days are not so good no matter where you are and you know people speak different languages yeah we all make different noises but 
somehow or other we all understand each other in the end. Or not. <laughs> People who speak the same language don't necessarily understand each other. <laughs> There's no innovation to be found. There's no excitement to be found. <coughs> That's why it's so short-lasting. People are, you know, that's why you always have to be looking for the new thing because the new thing wasn't new. Mm -hmm. So it didn't really satisfy you. It's really manic. Yes, <laughs> yes. So yes, I'm sorry, but so it, if it makes you a little bit more sore, that's good. That's good. More mistakes are made out of spontaneity. Now, there is something that we cultivate so that it becomes spontaneous, right? mm -hmm. which is the ten perfections. Mm -hmm. But notice what I just said, we cultivate them so they become spontaneous. Spontaneous to us means that you're so well trained that that is your default. In other words, what we're doing is we are re, uh, replacing negative karmic formations with positive karmic formations. But they are karmic formations. I we acknowledge that. I'm yeah. sorry, I have an example of that from my, my experience. Um, because I drive 6.35 to work, and you know now, since you drive it that way, yes. um, the speed limit is 60, but nobody drives 60. You have to drive 70 to not be a hazard on the road. Yes. <laughs> so I generally drive 70. And then a few days ago, I noticed everybody's passing me. And then I see this big uh, pickup truck coming up behind me, and then weaving and then he's you know weaving 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 up and i see him way doing that um continuously and and so he's going like 85 or 90 oh yeah right. yeah. yeah and my uh, what arose spontaneously was may you get to your destination safely without harming yourself or others and that that shocked me almost because previously i would have said <laughs> something yeah. very different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but With which we're all familiar. <laughs> but it, it was genuine. You know, yes. I was sincere and it just arose spontaneously. And that's from cultivating. Yes. It, it's yes. not going to come from nowhere. Yeah. <clears throat> Dependent arising. <laughs> right. It comes from something. So we have to put in the causes. That's why we also say it constantly, <laughs> right? Happiness and the causes of happiness. And we go give up suffering and the causes of suffering. Right? The causes of suffering are the karmic formations that are negative. The causes of happiness are the karmic formations that are positive. So when we are not established in the Dharma, being a little bit uh, slow to act is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's good to hesitate if it's if we're not sure. Hesitate. It's better. I mean, you can always do what you were going to do with later, but you cannot undo what you've done later. So, for example, if the thought comes up, you know, may you reach your destination safely, that's great. But if what starts to come out is you <laughs> hesitate, <laughs> don't, don't, don't allow the spontaneous expression, <laughs> not so good. There's a carpenter's rule, I say, measure twice, cut once. Yes. Count to ten. <laughs> Not used uh, very often in Texas driving. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Bless me to keep my view as high as a white-tailed eagle's and my conduct as careful as a blind man's on a steep mountain trail. 
So we should always strive right, to keep, to apply to all our experience, right, the highest version of the teaching that we can conceive of. We should always try to be looking at other sentient beings as Buddhas. We should try to see ourselves also as naturally perfect. But here it says, so, so that is, you know, the view as high as a uh, white tailed eagles. I'm not expert in Tibetan or mythology, but I believe that they are among the highest flying birds in Tibet. But notice what they say, and my conduct, as careful as a blind man on a steep mountain trail. How careful do you think a blind man on a steep mountain trail would be? Very careful. One could almost say even tentative. Mm -hmm. right? How do you know blind people usually? I'm sure in Tibet at that time they were not using the little sticks, right? But they probably had you know some version of it, right? A cane or or a little boy usually or so. Oh. You have to have to rely on something when you're blind. So as not to make a mistake, and you can't be running. <clears throat> In the beginning of our Dharma path, we can't be sprinting. If we sprint, we probably will make mistakes. So it's a counsel to be careful deliberate, slow, and rely, whether it's a walking stick or somebody else. But we need to rely on something that will uphold us and the Dharma as we walk, as we walk around this actually steep mountain road. We're all on it. We're all on it. So that is the end of this prayer. It's a very important prayer in mind training. And uh, I trust that maybe if we recite it a few times by ourselves, uh, now that we understand the meaning a little bit better, we can actually begin to allow it to settle in our minds. That is the purpose of this this practice, to settle in our minds and to begin to spontaneously manifest in our daily life. So let us dedicate. By the merit I grew through all our virtuous acts, May all be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all embrace happiness and the causes of happiness. May all abide in peace free from self-grasping. May all attain the union of wisdom and compassion. Om ah, um, so ah.